In a recent video, we looked at something called Tomei's function, in other words, a ruler function, and we proved that its limit was always zero. Well, today I wanna to look at the differentiability of this function. But before we jump into that, uh, let's recall exactly what we previously did. So let's define this function f from the open interval 0, 1 to r by the following rule. So f of x is equal to one over q, if x is equal to p over q, where the GCD of p and q is one. In other words, it's the denominator of x if x is rational and expressed in lowest terms. And then if x is irrational, we'll say that f of x is equal to zero. And previously we proved that for all a in zero one, the limit as x goes to a of f of x was equal to zero. So it didn't matter if that a was rational or irrational. But that being said, by the definition of the function, if a is irrational, that means that it's continuous there because the limit is equal to the function value. In other words, this function is continuous on 0, 1 minus q. In other words, the elements of 0, 1 that are irrational. And then we showed that it was discontinuous on 0, 1 intersect q. In other words, the elements of zero, one that are rational. Now today what we wanna do is explore the differentiability of this function. But let's observe that if a function is differentiable, it's necessarily continuous. So that means it's impossible for it to be differentiable on the rational portion of the interval from zero to one. So all we have to do is show that it is non-differentiable at irrational number. So let's keep that in mind for when we get around to proving it. I'd also like to recall that by the definition of differentiability via limits, we say that f is differentiable at a if the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a exists and is finite. And furthermore, I'm adapting this from a paper from William Dunham that's from 2003. Okay. So now I'd like to maybe push some definitions a little bit and let's observe that we could say that the limit is x goes to a of g of x exists and is finite if there exists a real number r such that the limit as x goes to a of g of x is equal to l. But observe, that's equivalent to saying by the limit definition of, or sorry, by the precise definition of the limit that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero such that if x minus a is between zero and delta, in other words, x is in a deleted neighborhood of a, then the absolute value of g of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, so now since we wanna show that uh, something is not differentiable, we have to show that a limit does not exist, but that means we need to negate this definition that we've built here. So let's do that negation here. So we would say that the limit, <laughs> <coughs> so we would say that the limit as x goes to a of g of x does not exist, and we'll include infinite in does not exist, if for all real numbers L, so that would be the maybe opposite of the existential statement is a for all statement. Let's just recall that when we negate a statement, for alls turn into there exists and vice versa, and then we negate a statement at the end. Okay, so for all L in R, and there exists an epsilon bigger than zero, such that for all delta bigger than zero, there exists an x such that the absolute value of x minus a is between zero and delta, and uh, the absolute value of g of x minus l is bigger than or equal to epsilon. So notice that there's a hidden for all x in this gap right here. So for all x, and that's negated here to this existential statement here. Okay, so anyway, we've got this definition of what it means for a limit to not exist. Now, let's use that to do our stated goal. In other words, prove that our function over here is nowhere differentiable. 
Now before we jump into the proof, make sure and click the thumbs up button, and if you haven't subscribed yet, think about subscribing, it really helps us out. Okay, so now we're going to show that f is nowhere differentiable. And observe that by this statement over here, which we pointed out before, we only need to check this on irrational numbers within the interval from 0 to 1. And now I'd like to make the following observation that gets us off the ground. And that is, if the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a exists, it must be 0. So if it's differentiable at a, its derivative must be 0. And that's what we'll build our argument around. So now, how would we prove this? So we'll do it by using a sequential limit. So let's take a sequence x in, um, and let's say that sequence is made up of irrational numbers between 0 and 1, satisfying two rules. So x in is not equal to a for all n. And the limit as x in or as n goes to infinity uh, of x in is equal to a. But then that means the following that the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a is the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x sub n minus f of a over x sub n minus a. And again, that's just by sequential um, limits here. Okay, so now what we can do is observe that since a is irrational, this is zero. And since each of these xn's are irrational, that's zero as well, which means we have this whole thing is equal to zero. Okay, nice. Now, what I want to do is maybe start over with a clean board and just use this fact right here to finish it off. Okay, so after pointing out that if this limit exists, it must be equal to zero, now we'll show that it can't be equal to zero. And if it can't be equal to zero, but it simultaneously has to be equal to zero if it exists, then that means, of course, that it cannot exist. And we're going to use that precise epsilon delta version of showing that a limit does not exist. Okay, so now what we want to do is fix some point A and that point A will be on the interval from 0 to 1, but not the rational number. So it'll be an irrational number between 0 and 1. And then let's set epsilon equal to 1. So let's recall in that negation of the limit definition via epsilons and deltas, instead of having a for all epsilon, we had a there exists epsilon. But we had a for all delta. So that means here we need to take any delta bigger than zero. Okay, so now here's the really cool trick that we're going to use here. So let's find a prime number and we'll maybe call that prime number p satisfying the following condition. So p is larger than the maximum of 1 over delta and 1 over a and 1 over 1 minus a. And so 1 over delta, 1 over a, and 1 over 1 minus a are all positive. So when we take the reciprocal, they're all positive. And furthermore, by the infinitude of primes, we know that we can always find a prime larger than any positive number. So this is something that we can always do. But now let's observe that by taking the reciprocal of that inequality, we have 1 over p is less than the minimum of delta a and 1 minus a. Again, just by taking the reciprocal, the maximum kind of clearly turns into a minimum. But now let's observe the following, and that is the interval a minus 1 over p to a plus 1 over p is pretty clearly contained in the interval a minus delta to a plus delta. Given that this 1 minus, sorry, 1 over p is less than delta. Okay, cool. And then another thing that I'd like to observe is the following, and that is the width of this interval is equal to 2 over p. I think, well, that's pretty clear. But the fact that this is 2 over p, that tells us that there exists 
some number k that is between 0 and p, sorry, between 1 and p, satisfying the following rule, k over p is inside of this interval. So a minus delta, sorry, a minus 1 over p to a plus 1 over p. That's because we've got an uh, interval with width 1 over p. So, or sorry, 2 over p. So the distance from one endpoint to the other endpoint is 2 over p. So that means there must be some multiple of 1 over p within that interval. Okay, cool. And then let's also note the following. And that is that a uh, cannot be equal to k over p. And that's because A is irrational, whereas K over P is rational. All right, so now we're ready to make our final calculation. So let's put our final calculation in this purple box that we're doing. Okay, so now what we want to do is set X equal to this number K over P that we've constructed. So let's recall that by the negation of that definition we had, there was a there exists X statement. And that's the X that we have right here. We brought it into existence via that construction over there. Okay, so we're gonna set X equal to K over P and observe that that is an element of A minus delta to A plus delta, given that we have this subset relationship here. And I guess I should say with X not equal to A. So it satisfies the condition that we need the absolute value of x minus a is strictly between zero and delta. Okay, cool. But then let's also note the following, the absolute value of f of x minus f of a. So that's gonna be equal to simply just f of x. And we know that because f of a is zero, but we also know f of x because this is in lowest terms, because p is a prime, we know that, that this is equal to 1 over p. But now let's observe that 1 over p is going to be bigger than the absolute value of x minus a. And that's because this x, k over p, was chosen so that it was in this smaller interval right here. That smaller interval has width one, 2 over p, sorry, 2 over p. But as long as it's not at the extreme endpoint, which it can't be because we have an open interval here, that means that the distance to the center is always less than one over P. Okay, nice. But now where can we go from there? Well, the important thing here is that we've got the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is bigger than x minus a. That one over P term in there was just part of the um, method of getting that inequality. But that means that we can divide the x minus a over and we'll have the absolute value of f of x minus f of a over x minus a is bigger than one. But that means we did it. We found an epsilon so that for any delta bigger than zero, there existed an x on the interval a minus delta to a plus delta where this was larger than our epsilon. Exactly what we needed to show that this limit was not equal to zero. And like I said before, if it's not equal to zero, it can't exist. And that means that our function is nowhere differentiable. And that's a good place to stop.